Hi, everybody. And thanks for joining this session. Uh, maybe someone can uh, close the door, please. Thank you. So the, the topic, the purpose of this session is just to, to give a, a presentation, an overview of all the evolution that, uh, that have been done in the load tracking mechanism uh, that is used in the scheduler for task placement, for detecting what, the, what is the utilization of the CPU and how, to, how we are using that in the scheduler right now. So, um, yeah, for the agenda, I will start with an introduction. I don't know if everybody really know how the load track, what is the load tracking mechanism in the scheduler. So I will give a, a short explanation on how we are tracking the load and what does it mean. And then I will go through all the change that have been pushed in mainline from 4.9 to the latest kernel that we have and which kind of problem we have solved and wh how, why that should be better for us and task placement and scheduling as a whole. Um, then, yeah, I will mention a bit what are the main us usage of this load tracking mechanism and also the next step that we can have a look at. And if there is any good idea, we can include that as well. So let's start with uh, the introduction. So in the scheduler, um, we have what we call the pair entity load tracking mechanism. So that's a way to track the load as a wide description of each entity that are scheduled on the CPU. So by entity, that can be either a task or a group of tasks. And the goal is to evaluate how much CPU is needed and so to, to place them and also evaluate how much load it's used to balance between each CPU, each task and give a, a fairness in the scheduling time. So um, for that, uh, we have divided the time in segment of one millisecond. In fact, it's around one millisecond. It's exactly 1,024 microseconds just to make the computation easier because it's just some shift of the bit. So that's more efficient for us. And what we are using is typical geometric series where we are waiting the past times, times, uh, time slot so that the more recent time slot have a bigger impact on the load tracking computation. So we are averaging that in order to get an average value. So this geometric series, we are using what we call the half period, which is 32 milliseconds. So it means that utilization time slot after 32 milliseconds will wait for half of the total utilization. So this have been used, it's a bit empiric in the sense that this has been selected uh, to, to be um, a good time window compared to the scheduling time on a system that is using something like a CPU. So maybe this should be changed according if you have a larger or smaller system, but for now it's hard coded for, in order to be really efficient because we are calling that a lot of time per, for each uh, time slot and scheduling time slice. So we need to optimize everything. And this load, uh, in this load, we have three, three metrics. In fact, it's not only one metric, but it's in fact three metrics. The first one is what we call the util average or the utilization. It's really the running time of, a, of an entity, how much time we are really running, either because we want to run, but uh, yeah, it's really running and not waiting for running. The, the other one is the load average. The load average, it's a bit different in the sense that we are taking into account the waiting time, when how much time you, have, you are waiting for a CPU to compute what you have to do. And we are also taking into account the, um, the priority of the task. In order to, the goal is that if you have a higher priority, so you need more running time, or you expect more running time than, than other, you're just uh, inflating your, your load. And the last one, which is the load, the runnable load average, is, so this, Third metric is only used at the run queue level, and it's mainly, so this is just the sum of the load of the runnable task, mainly because the load, yeah, I sh maybe I should have mentioned that. So the load average for the run queue is 
the sum of the load of each entity on, this, on, the, on the run queue. This entity can be running run queue, runnable run queue, or wait or sleeping, um, um, sorry, sleeping scale entity. So the runnable part is just the sum of the runnable scale entity. Just to give you what is currently trying to run on this CPU and give, um, putting apart all the sleeping tasks. So that just describe what uh, I was mentioning. So the utility leverage value just the run part, the load average include the waiting part, and in the run queue, so the run part is the sum of all the running part. So this give you a chart of the utilization. So here we have the CPU utilization, so it's increasing. So I have just, it's just the, the um, load tracking of this kind where we have two tasks which try to schedule to run at the same time, so we have one wait, one task must wait, whereas the other one can run directly, and we have the run queue. So this is the utilization, which is the sum of both running together. Or you can see that there we have some blocked things that will come back a bit later. So that's quite simple. The goal is really to have a sum, so when we migrate an entity from one CPU to another one, everything stay uh, self-contained. For the runnable, it's a bit more difficult to see. I hope that it's not too fuzzy, but um, I have just made sure that the two tasks have a different nice priority, and that make a huge difference for this. For example, we have a first task here, which is quite low in the load, and the other one, which is much higher. So that gives him more runtime, virtual runtime on the, on the run queue. And then we are summing them, and also we have this runnable part that just gives you, for example, that when both tasks are sleeping, the runnable load average is nil, whereas the load in itself stay high. To say that even if right now I'm idle, I have a lot of tasks that I've run recently there. So maybe they will come up soon, so don't put, too much, don't put that much more tasks there, because otherwise I will have to, 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 figure, to, to find a solution to schedule everything. So, yeah, that's for the, um, that's, for the introduction. Uh, now I will go through all the evolutions. So starting for the 4.9 kernel, I will explain all the changes that have been done until the latest kernel. So this, in this, I'm describing how the load tracking mechanism was working on the 4.9 and all the problem that we were facing. So one first thing was that uh, once a CPU become idle, its utilization and its load were stalled to the last running value. And because it was stalled, it means that at the scheduler level, this CPU was seen as loaded even if nothing had happened for a while. So it was, uh, that was creating some wrong exception at the scheduler level. You know where we should place one task or another. The other one was there here, when the task was migrating from one CPU, this is the green, to, the, to another one, in fact, when the task was migrating, its utilization was not migrating. So the CPU could be idle with high utilization because, just because the task just migrated, but not its utilization. So, which means that we, uh, we, we had to wait for the load tracking mechanism to stabilize to the new state. And because in the scheduler, we are migrating a lot of time, a lot, we are often migrating the task in order to optimize the utilization of the CPU. At the end, your utilization or your load was not really accurate compared to your current state. We had few other problems, which were the stability. For some small tasks, the load was moving around without any good reason. Uh, also, I'm, uh, I'm mentioning the load sharing. I don't know if all of, uh, of you are aware of that, but when you are using task group. So the goal of the task group is to schedule a group of tasks, and this group of tasks should not use more CPU than if, they were, it, if it was only one single task. So for that, we have what we call a share. So how much of this equivalent of one task we are sharing between the different run queue. And so this should uh, move according to which task we are running on each, uh, on each run queue. And the last one was that, so this is the frequency 
change that happening thanks to the load tracking. So yeah, we are using the utilization in order to set the frequency of the CPU and adapt that. And the point was that when the task, yeah, the, when the task migrate, was migrating, the frequency was decreasing even if the, um, the frequency was shared between CPU, which means that we have to wait for the new, the utilization of the, on, on the new CPU to increase slowly in order to increase the, task, the frequency, which was just creating some, um, some regression in performance without any good reason because the, the um, things that we have to compute was still there. It was just because we have changed from one CPU to another one. So based on all these um, uh, problem, we have started to, to make some, uh, some changes. So when I say we, it's not only me, it's a lot of people have been involved in that. I haven't put the, the, aut the authorship of all the patch yet, but um, it's, these have been done by a lot of different people. So the first things that have been pushed is the propagation. So when a task migrate, we have started to migrate also its utilization so that the utilization of a CPU always reflects the current utilization. That was the first things. Then we have also optimized the algorithm because it can be called, so the load tracking with the one millisecond uh, time slice can be, um, uh, can be called several times Per tick. I mean, I don't have. It can be probably more than uh, sometimes more than 10 or 20 times per tick. So we can't afford to spend too much time doing that. So these have been optimized. We have also increased the accuracy for the small task. That what was I went mentioning there? The fact that when small task was running, a task that was running less than one millisecond, for example, you were seeing some fluctuation without any good reason. And then in 4.13, um, yeah, we have also taken, uh, improved also, yes, the fact where we were starting in the time window in order to remove that. Which means that in 4.14, we have redo the same kind of test to see what was still missing. So you can see that we still have the stalled utilization value for idle CPU, which means that they are still seen as big task, big CPU or EV CPU. Now we have the migration of the, of the utilization and the load between CPU, mm -hmm. so, which means that there is no more frequency change when we are migrating. We still have a problem in the sense that the frequency is increasing and when we, we, are, we were idle for a long time, we are going back to low frequency and increasing. So here, we have mentioned that, so the load sharing is still not yet accurate because when a new task is running in the same task group, the share should, should be changed to take into account this new running task. But we have more stable task, more stable um, utilization for small tasks. So this was for the 4.14. Uh, so based on that, we have modified the propagation mechanism in order to take into account what we call the runnable, the fact that when we're migrating a task, we're also migrating the runnable, and that will help us to update what we call the share between task group. So that was main things. This, so I haven't reflected that, but also in 4.16, uh, the utilization of deadline skate class have been implemented, so we were tracking, we were able to, to take into account how much bandwidth is needed in a CPU because of deadline task. And also the invariance and the OPP selection have been implemented as well. Just to, <clears throat> so for that, it's just that running for a deadline task running at lowest uh, OPP or highest OPP doesn't make the, the, the same difference. So we are taking that into account in order to, when we are counting the running time of each task. And if, uh, to know when we, we, we have to, to block the task because uh, it has used more time than expected. What we have also done, so yeah, we have also decayed this blocked utilization for idle CPU. The fact that some CPU which were idle for a long time can be seen as busy CPU. Uh, 
the utilized also have been implemented in Merge. So the goal of this is to save the, less, the last highest utilization of a task before going to sleep so that when the task wake up, instead of waiting for its utilization to, to raise slowly, we can anticipate to say, okay, the last time the task was running, they reached this level of utilization, so let's start to assume that it will reach the same value directly. That will help us to prevent some uh, OPP switching. Uh, we have also implemented the uh, tracking of uh, utilization for RT task. So, and for the deadline, that's another thing. So the first one, the utilization was computed based on the request set for each deadline task. So the fact that you have the, your period and your running time, and based on that, you know how much CPU is needed. But we're also tracking that with the load tracking mechanism, just to get, um, um, or to, to say that, yeah, the main, uh, one main, one interesting thing was to, to compute how much time was stolen by deadline task and RT task to CFS task, just because the CFS task is the lowest priority task, so they just, they can just use what is remaining. And we need to take that into account when we are placing the task. And we have also implemented the utilization tracking, uh, the IRQ tracking mechanism. So we are now tracking the time spent in the interrupt context as well. And we are taking that into account for frequency scaling, but whereas it was not the case before. So the, yeah, the it, normally the interrupt time is just not seen by the scheduler. So this is the latest uh, version of the load tracking in the scheduler. So as you can see now, we are starting directly at the final frequency, thanks to ETLS. So we can estimate what will be the final utilization. So we don't slowly increase or decreasing. We directly switch between we, are, we have some running task or we don't have any task, and we can go back to a lower OPP. Um, we still have the load and the utilization propagation. We are now decaying slowly uh, the utilization of idle CPU. And the share also, we can see that the load of a task, when another task in the same uh, task group is, is running, we are decreasing his load so that it will not take too much runtime compared to other task groups. <clears throat> yeah, I haven't seen that, but also the runnable load is correctly uh, uh, computed now. And um, so that's what, uh, uh, that's where we are right now. Something much more stable and clean compared to the first one. If we come back, for example, to this version, you can see that there were a lot of change, a lot of instability in the, in the, in the metric that was creating some, um, strange scheduler behavior or wrong task placement decision <clears throat> compared to what we have now there. So that's all what we have done that just give you an idea of how much change I've done since 4.9. So I can only encourage you to use the latest version if you want to have a, a good scheduling That depends on uh, when you mean uh, what you mean by idle. Normally, if nothing is running, that should be. Oh yes, th there is a mic. So yeah, the, the question was, what is the load and the utilization when a CPU is idle? How, oh. How do you decay the utilization and the load when all the CPUs are idle? So we are taking um, advantage of different mechanism. Either so, in the load in the in the scheduler, we are. Um, from time to time, we are waking up an idle CPU to see if it should pu uh, pull some tasks from other CPU. So for example, if you have two tasks running on one CPU, we will wake up another CPU that will check if it was pulling a task on an idle CPU or, keep, or, or, or let the two tasks on the same CPU. And when we wake up the, this CPU, we take advantage to also decay this. Also, when a CPU go idle, we take advantage to update all the block load as well of other CPU. 
So the goal is to minimize. We can't do that directly when we, uh, in the, what we call the hot pass, when we are scheduling tasks, when we are switching tasks. Instead, we are taking advantage of some uh, um, event where we can afford to waste some time doing this. So we are waking up one, most of the time we are waking up one CPU that will do the job for all the idle CPU. That's why you are seeing there. So it's happening from time to time. And uh, I don't remember if it's 16 or 32 milliseconds, the period where we try to update. Okay, so if, the, if all CPUs are idle, we are not updating anything. Yeah, in this nothing is updated, but yeah. it's updated when the, fir the first CPU is working yes. up. Okay. We, are, we update, and we, then suddenly we have all the utilization decaying. Yeah. In, in okay. Yeah. If all CPU are idle, we not uh, we will not wake up for any for. There is no reason to wake up a CPU. But yeah, once the first CPU will wake up, in this case, we will start to update everything. Okay. And w w why there is a difference between a blocked idle in? Uh, I think it's two slides before. Yeah, uh, there is, why is block idle and decay for block idle? What is the difference between uh, decaying for blocked idle and, and not blocked idle? What is the difference? Here we have blocked idle. Yeah, okay. it's just that. And uh, what is the difference between uh, decaying with block load and without block load? No, the, uh, w what I mean that there is that uh, the load of uh, idle CPU is blocked to its la last update. And the goal is to decay that. Because we are idle, we will decay the value slowly. Otherwise, when, um, if the CPU are not idle for a long time, we'll, we'll have this update that will happen on the CPU. So we'll update that regularly. And even if the CPU is running, we're updating the load in the utilization regularly. So this is really to decay this part, which is blocked. By blocked, it's not the blocked. It's not the. It's not, blo it's not task bloat on IOs, for example, no, no, sleeping. No. Okay. Uh, so right now, yeah. The usage of pellet. So it's mainly for task placements, a load balance. Uh, so the goal is to make sure that um, we are using all the capacity available in each CPU. So with the utilization, we can know if there is some uh, non-use uh, part of the CPU. And the load will help us to, to make some fair scheduling between tasks, making sure that uh, they will have the same amount of running time in average. Uh, so yeah, so um, that's there. We have this spare capacity. So when we are selecting a CPU, we'll look for a CPU with the most available compute capacity. And we're also using that for the scheduler governor, which is a um, CPU frag governor, which is linked directly with the scheduler. So, because the utilization, because the utilization of a task migrate with this task, we can anticipate what will be the best OPP on the CPU when the task migrate. And also, we are using that to prevent some spurious frequency switch in the sense that. For example, right now in the, in the main line, uh, the goal is to run at max OPP when an RT task is running, and then select the best OPP when a CFS task is running. But because <coughs> the RT task preempts the CFS task and stalls some time, the CFS task can be seen as not really busy, just because it will use the remaining time on the CPU. So we were seeing some OPP switch between when the RT task was running, we were running at max OPP. And once the CFS task was running, we were seeing that this task, for example, was only using half of the CPU because only half of the CPU was remaining. So we were decreasing the OPP, whereas in fact, the CPU was fully used. It's just that it was only half the CPU was available. So we, we are using that and the RT load tracking to make sure that we'll stay at the max frequency. But the two main usage that we have for now, I don't know if there is any idea for new usage. I mean, you are more than welcome to try that or make some proposal. And the next step for us, so one next step is that we would like to, in, to add the thermal pressure in this tracking mechanism, just because to, to see that like, uh, if you are, when you have thermal mitigation, you're just capping the max frequency, so you are stealing some compute capacity. And we want to take that into account. So when a CPU 
is kept because of thermal mitigation. We'll, we'll see in that as a, some utilization that is no more available, so we can take that when placing task. We also, we also want to update the scale invariance. Right now, the utilization, we have a limitation where we're computing the utilization. The utilization can go above the current operating point. So that gives us some uh, uh, limitation. And the last part is that right now, uh, we are using the time and the frequency to estimate the computation of a task. And the goal would be to see how we can use some hardware counter instead of uh, just to have some more realistic value. Instead of emulating this, the goal will be to use this, the, some real hardware counter where you can, count how, many, how many cycles have been really used by each task. Uh, and maybe to make some difference between CPU bonded and memory bonded task. I have already discussed that with some, um, but yeah, that, uh, that will be help us to know if a task is really, really needs some cycle or just needs some time Sorry? Yeah. I was just asking, is there, is there hardware already out there? Uh, I'm not I sure that for ARM um, there is something, ARM. but for example, in Intel, there is this APF, MPF stuff. And for example, because of the current implementation of the scale invariance, they have this effect. Oh, I think I, I'm out of time. Yeah, yeah they, they have this effect. That creates some problem for them to use the current implementation, so because they have some hardware control itself. Uh, and I think that's, yeah, that's all. Uh, I'm not sure that we have time for one question. Nevertheless, tomorrow there is a hacking session on the same topic or where we can follow and go more in detail or discuss about any point that you want to, to address. Yeah. I was just curious, you said you were going to try removing the capping of the load tracking by the current frequency. So yeah. do you have any ideas how to do that? Because it seems like a tough problem, right? I mean, if you're operating at half of F max and it saturates the CPU, the task load, how do you know, you know what, it's, what it's headed to until you increase the operating point, the, the frequency? Um, yeah, that, that's one main problem right now. The, the, the assumption that is done right now is that if you're reaching the current utilization, the current capacity, you will increase the frequency. And by that, you will go over this limitation. But we still have some cases where it's not working right, correctly. So that's why you want to remove that, and we want to switch to another way. Instead of taking to account the current capacity, we just want to scale the time used. That's a, di a different way. Right now, we are scaling the, um, the utilization, the, the impact, and instead, we want to scale the time. It, something similar to using hardware counter, where in hardware counter, if you are counting the number of CPU cycle, running at a lower frequency will give you less cycle, time cycle, CPU cycle, which is some kind of time cycle. So we want to go in this, in this direction, but we have some problem to fix before that. Thank you.